Hello, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to present at Easy Sand this year. My name is Fernando Zampiegui. I'm a research intensivist from HCOR and BrickNet in Brazil. The title of this presentation is Sepsis Attributable Mortality, which is a very challenging topic, mostly because we have very few data on it. So I'm going to pass through what we know, what we don't know, and what is, after all, Sepsis Attributable Mortality. I have several conflicts of interest, but I'm not involved in, or I have not received any direct funding, reimbursement, consulting fees, stock changes, and most of the funding I have received was for conducting investigator-initiated trials. So uh, this question is uh, particularly interesting, and I'm going to start discussing it with uh, two, two patients, two hypothetical patients. So one is a 24-year-old patient with no previous uh, medical history that has an acute bacterial meningitis and dies from respiratory shock at 48 hours. And the second patient is an 80-year-old uh, patient with prostate cancer, uh, uh, a low performance status, two previous admissions, a patient that has been worsening in the past months, and then he's admitted to the hospital to manage pain or hypercalcemia. Then he develops an osocomal pneumonia and dies at day 10 from multiple organ failure. So if you have to guess, uh, of course, you can say that sepsis kills uh, for both the scenarios. But of course, if you have to guess uh, how much did sepsis change the outcome, which is clear that for the first patient, all the mortality was due to the infection. Uh, well, while for the second patient, much of the mortality was due to the baseline disease, and perhaps sepsis was just you know, a little knock over and was just uh, uh, ca causing death by a smaller percentage than in the first patient. So, uh, of course, meningitis kills and also common pneumonia might kill, and we can discuss that a lot. So, uh, if we assume that sepsis is a universally death condition without further investing in it, this is a, a kind of the bag in the question. So if you assume that sepsis is always lethal or is always a, a problem without actually measuring it in several contexts, so you are actually begging the question. And to improve care and actually to save lives for, for sepsis patients, you have to understand where sepsis is more deadly and where it may not be the primary problem of the patient. So we can discuss a lot. I'm going to pass fast through it. Of course, if, uh, some may say is the sepsis concept usual. After all, in this scenario, of course, there are several pros for that, like it's a single term for blood application. It creates this pretty carb for, for managing sepsis. It's easier to mobilize actors that are involved in, in policy care, in patient care and policymakers. But of course, the general concept of sepsis perhaps uh, has some cons, like uh, generalization, litigation, uh, Maybe it's a little bit uh, untouched from the personalized medicine agenda. Uh, so, uh, and after all, if you name everything sepsis and you're going to name some conditions with a lower mortality sepsis, you may actually undermine the real importance of sepsis for managing uh, our very sick patients. So what, what's the attribute fraction after all? So the attribute fraction of a disease uh, is the fraction of the disease, uh, the, the fraction of uh, uh, death uh, that uh, is explained by uh, the disease or in the context of, of a risk factor, the fraction of the occurrence of the disease that is, that is explained by the risk factor. So we are talking about uh, from all deaths that occurred, how many deaths were caused by sepsis? And that would be the population at virtual fraction or that a virtual fraction in the sample of sepsis in that scenario. And of course, this should vary. Uh, this can be estimated uh, by many ways. So uh, Eventually, if you have any 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 model that can provide the probability of death, like risk regression, boosted models, etc., you can get probabilities of a patient's dying, uh, and then you can uh, check whether uh, how much these probabilities increase, and you can put it, plug it back in the formula, and you can estimate uh, the sepsis attributable fraction of mortality. So I'm going to pass through some examples. So uh, the first, a uh, very good effort on this is a. Uh, Four years old now. It's a paper by Von Vug and JAMA. Uh, it assesses the uh, population attribution mortality fraction of ICU acquired infections in, in critically ill patients. And the results were rather compelling. So, for patients that were admitted with sepsis, a second septic episode was associated with uh, a 10% uh, attribution fraction of mortality. That is, 10% of all patients that died died due to sepsis. And, but it was even higher for patients that were not admitted with sepsis. So for those patients, 
of all those patients who died, a fifth of those patients probably died due to sepsis. So you may, you may say that these numbers may be lower than expected. And of course, this, this, this study is limited by the very wide confidence intervals you're looking at the screen. But this provides compelling evidence that it's a problem. So 20% is a lot. So you have a very good margin to improve that. 10% uh, is still a lot. So there's a still a very important margin. And what's interesting to see is that the fraction increases uh, as the patient spends more time in the ICU. And this is something to be expected because uh, being alive at the ICU at one day is a necessary condition to have sepsis at that day. So this is a very important concept we are going to drop by later. We have, uh, we have some databases and we, we check a little bit how does this comes out. So uh, the checklist trial was published in JAMA in 2016, I guess. It was a trial on whether uh, a checklist intervention would improve outcomes in Brazilian ICUs for the cluster randomized trial. Uh, and when we plug the data for catheter-related bloodstream infections, uh, urinary tract infections, and, and ventilator-associated pneumonia, what we see is that the majority of patients, so it's uh, around 11,000 patients here, did not have uh, any uh, infections event. So this is good for the patient. Uh, and you have a lower frequency. So the most common scenario here was the patient having a urinary tract infection, which is something that's really hard to define in critical ill patients. Then you go for VAP, then you go for CLABSI, so we're talking about 3.5%. So uh, in, at least in this world, uh, it does not seem to be very, very common. When you look at the regression models for that, you can conclude that the attribution fraction was around 5%, let's say, uh, when you adjust for baseline inner severity. And of course, this was a little bit higher for CLABSI and low, very lower, uh, lower for urinary tract infections or VAP. So this, uh, of course, this uh, there are several shortcomings uh, we are going to talk about in the next couple of minutes. But this highlights that we need better trials and we need better understanding on actually what is the attributive fraction. Because if it's that low, uh, you, you cannot design a trial to decrease mortality due to ventilator-associated pneumonia if the attributive fraction of mortality of ventilator-associated pneumonia is low. So this is a very important point to be clear for the community. We have a second ongoing uh, uh, observational study, which is the MAPA trial, the MAPA study. So it's a, a case control study, uh, about 3,600 patients. Uh, they are paired by type of admission. Uh, half of the patients were discharged and half of the patients perished uh, in the hospital. So these are, these are the hospital patients. And what we see is that the patients that were discharged, around 30% had at least one septic event uh, during their RCU stay. For the patients who perished, around 50% had a septic episode. But of course, you have to take into account length of stay, reason for admission, a comorbidity, and a several other markers of severity to, to have a picture. But let's just stick with this data and have a look. So patients were relatively uh, old, uh, balanced in terms of gender. Most patients were admitted due to medical reasons. Around one fifth of the patients already already received antibiotics at admission, and we can do a contingency table, a two by two table here, and and, and check the odds of dying uh, whether the patient has sepsis. Sepsis here were defined by um, a new introduction of antibiotics due to a new organ failure in the context of no other known cause or measurable cause for organ failure. So we, we collected data daily for, for the patient. So, but of course, this is just a pool data uh, considering uh, the, the, the whole period. So we are not looking over time on how things are going. And if you check the attributable fraction in the population of mortality, you're around at 40%. So confidence intervals are a little bit wider. This is an unadjusted analysis. So we are working on adjusting the model uh, for uh, age, uh, length of age, reason for admission, et cetera. Uh, but this is uh, this point that perhaps uh, for war patients, and most of the patients were war patients, uh, having a, a, a septic event is something that's a life changer, perhaps more than for ICU patients. And that makes conceptually uh, uh, much of a sense. So uh, as I said, the, the time is important, and we are currently working on assessing that uh, in an stochastic model uh, by uh, placing, uh, well, like the patient is, you know, this is a mode state model where the patient is on, starts in a state like alive in the, uh, in the hospital. 
and then he can uh, switch to other states with a given probability. Uh, for example, while well, the patient has sepsis one day, what's the probability that he dies the next day, etc. And by that, you can call out, you can pull uh, a more uh, specific and conditioned probability measurements uh, for 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 the model. So you can you can query, for example, was the probability that a patient with a given condition at a given day that develops sepsis dies versus a patient, a very similar patient that did not have sepsis. And then you can have a measurement of a relative risk and, let's say, uh, 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 other measurements of risk, that are like uh, relative risk, etc., for for the patient dying that day. So, in conclusion, uh, sepsis, uh, whatever that is, uh, is responsible for a, a significant proportional half of deaths in hospitalized patients. But of course, it depends on the patient, depends on the source, depends on timing and on management. And we have reasons to believe that for uh, all patients that are hospitalized, we can say that uh, attribute of mortality is definitely not zero uh, or not one, but it may be somewhere near 10 to 40%, depending on the patient. Uh, and perhaps this is uh, even higher for, uh, for some specific scenarios and some specific sources. So, Thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's a pleasure to present here at the same. See you next year.